Afternoon, men. Everybody hear me okay? I want to first thank Coach Wiley for inviting me back here to speak. I used to love coming, I uh, started coming to this clinic uh, when I was assisting Paul Boudreau down in Jacksonville, and it's the first time I got exposed to this clinic. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be invited back to speak one time. It's been a couple of years, but I never leave this place without having taken pages and pages of notes. I've now uh, been, been coaching in the National Football League for 13 years, and I still feel like I'm learning something new every day. Uh, I certainly learn things from my players. I learn things from watching other teams, watching what uh, some of the coaches around the league are doing. I'm learning a lot from watching college tape this time of year. We're evaluating our players getting ready for the draft, and we're you know, looking at things and saying, really these college uh, offenses we're looking at are so innovative. We're, we're constantly trying to keep up with what it is that we're seeing in the college game. I know our passing guys, our quarterback coaches, our coordinators are getting awfully excited about things, and they'll constantly come to me and say, hey, let's get a run out of this. Because my background has been uh, to jump into two back, be in the eye, and just hammer them. Okay, but I've had to evolve along the way uh, that running game, and anyway, it's been fun to continue to learn. So 13 years now in the National Football League coaching, when I went into interview with Coach Reed in Kansas City, and I hadn't known him before that, uh, he sat me down and said, well, what, what I'm looking for is uh, an experienced line coach, and that, the first thought that came into my mind was, well, you can't mean me because I feel like I'm just getting started on this thing. And uh, one of the great things about it is this coaching game, this coaching business is, has made me young again. Uh, and what I mean by that is I, start, I was fortunate enough to have played uh, tackle in this league for 12 years, which was awesome. Uh, a great opportunity. And this is a, the greatest sport in the world the greatest game, and, and we all know that and believe that for all the, the reasons, but it is, it does take a toll on you at a point you go from, and this is a hard thing for an athlete who has gone uh, through his youth as, oh yeah, we're gonna pick you, we want you on our team, we want you to be our starter, and you, and you go through years and, oh, we want you to be a free agent, we would like you to come play for us, yeah, you're our guy, you're our guy, and you're constantly trying to get better as a player, but then at a point your body starts to fail you. And you, you don't like what you're seeing on tape. I know what I'm supposed to do, right? About that eighth year as a player, I think, where you've gained a certain amount of experience and uh, physical maturity, seventh, eighth year, I think, is that sweet spot. But then it starts to go downhill. Then, then you start relying on that experience, those techniques, those things that help you overcome some of the deficiencies as your body starts to fail you. But it's tough on the mind because you're not liking what you're seeing and pretty soon uh, they're telling you, hey listen, we're gonna, we gotta get this other guy some reps in here, we gotta get him ready and uh, that'll wear you out. At any rate, uh, it, it's a tough deal to go from as a 34 year old person feeling old and used up. Now I get to step in to be a coach, started off as a graduate assistant, and all of a sudden I'm the young guy. I'm making copies. I learned how to use uh, a, a laminator. I'll tell you what, I started laminating shit. I'm, I'm like going home, tell my wife, what do you, you, got a, 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 you got a recipe right there? I'll get that laminated, okay? <laughs> I thought that was the greatest thing ever. And I've learned all kinds of stuff, how to use a computer, uh, how to break down film. I felt young again, man, I'm staying up late. Boy, where'd the hours go? 17 hour day, boom, nothing. It was awesome. So if there was no better feeling in the world than physically dominating somebody, pancaking them, okay, that, that's the best feeling in the world. That's, you know, you, practicing football, not fun. It's not fun. Uh, playing the games, okay, that can be a gut-wrenching uh, experience. But when you physically dominate someone and put them on the ground, okay, that's why, uh, that's why we do it. That's the best feeling in the world. Can't match it. But if you could come close to it, okay, that feeling would be 
watching someone that you've coached use a technique that you've worked on, watching them do it. Okay, that's right there. Right there with that feeling. And I, that was a huge surprise to me, a great uh, surprise to me that, that made coach it meant this is, you, you, can't, you can't get this working on Wall Street. You can't get this working at a bank in Chicago. Okay, that's a great feeling. So being able to work with these uh, younger men and have them use the techniques and try to implement some things we were learning, best thing ever. I've had some great teachers along the way Okay, we met Tony Wise last night. Tony, where are you? Okay, Tony Wise and I were in Chicago together. I got to play for Tony for five years. So, uh, and probably of all the coaches that I played for, and there's been some great ones, I have the closest relationship with him. Well, we're, we're both coaches now, so I, I'm able to talk with him. And, but a uh, fantastic teacher and a great mentor, a great, uh, you know, he was my coach, but... I had so much respect for him and a great relationship with him. So, you know, it's great to have Tony here tonight. Um, I got a chance to play for Howard Mudd and Hudson Houck and Russ Grimm. Okay, some great teachers along the way. And then I've learned a lot from assistant coaches I've worked with, a, a, a ton from some great running back coaches, some great tight end coaches, some defensive coaches uh, giving me some, some nuggets. So feeling young and like I can always learn something and then I, shoot I've already filled up a half a notebook from last night's speakers today so what I want to talk to you about today specifically we get to the tape here is we'll be picking up on a lot of the stuff that coach McNally was just talking about and that will be um, what we're doing in our run game uh, mostly with our inside zone talking about uh, physical leverage before I get to that physical leverage and how we teach it, how we drill it, uh, I would like to just touch on the idea of positional leverage. Now, this is something that I've learned a lot of it by trial and error because, as I mentioned before, it used to be that we were all eye back, two back, uh, certainly quarterback underneath with our run game. Very little shotgun run, but we've evolved to more and more shotgun run. And, you know, some of you may say, yeah, uh, right, you've been doing this for years, and, and I'm going to point out just something that I've learned the hard way just by trial and error, and that is the idea of positional leverage. So. And that is the idea of positional leverage. So before we get to the physical leverage, and this, this idea was introduced to me uh, when I played for Hudson Houck. You know, he talks about relative position and body position, two kinds of leverages. Okay, relative position, we'll just, we'll say that's where I am relative to the ball carrier and the defender. Basically, you want to be between them. You want to be between the defender and the ball carrier whether you're talking run game or pass game, this is all gonna apply. But, so when we would be quarterback underneath and we'd run our inside zone, whether you called it 34, 94, our inside zone, where the back was open crossover, chasing the inside leg of the tackle, we would tell our tackle, and I learned this from Paul Boudreaux, look, we're gonna take a position step, we're gonna get our second step to the near foot, and we're gonna have our hat tight outside. Okay, so I don't know what tight outside is. You could give them a landmark, a cheekbone, a nostril, hat tight outside. Okay, but the, the key thing there was that we were teaching them to target our second foot. We wanted our second step to the near foot. That would put us in good relative position on inside zone. Okay, that would be hat tight outside in this case of this defensive end as the back sunk this run into the heels of the offensive lineman. All right, but when we started running shotgun zone, uh, at first uh, it was new to us. We still called it 34 or 94, we, just inside zone. And we even, uh, even tried to continue to chase that front side tackle. 
well, that completely uh, distorted this play. Uh, so what we said is, here's what we got to do. Back, you've got to take the same footwork, open crossover, downhill. You're on the same exact path you were. Now you're chasing the inside leg of the center. So you can see here, if we go back, okay, how this looks to a defender as compared to how that looks to a defender. The relative position has changed. Well, it, we, we were slow in changing what we were doing. Okay, hat, tight outside, second step to the near foot and all that. And we were getting tackles for uh, negative yardage. Okay, we're having guys in our backfield. Well, so if we want to be in good relative position between our defender and the back, you know, people talk about a cylinder, okay, hat tight outside of that cylinder, not necessarily the defensive end. As it relates to the back, as to what he's seeing, okay, when we're in the shotgun, I've got my hat still tight outside of that cylinder, but it might be on the inside of the defensive end as compared to the outside. So just a little food for thought. Once we did that, okay, then we realized, yeah, so that, that definitely makes a difference for all these guys and understanding where we are in relation to our runner. If we're in the dot, we've got the quarterback underneath and he's running inside zone, and you're talking about a backside scoop block, would call it a B block, and you take that straight line that that Mike linebacker has right to that runner, we can see that that scoop block can't be as thick as it might be, right? It's gonna happen quicker. I'm gonna to have to give a lever board. I'm gonna to have to lever and go to intersect that Mike linebacker because he's gonna take a direct path to that runner if he's got that gap, all right? But when we're in the gun, we can see that angle changes dramatically, all right? So we can be thicker on these double teams. Just a little food for thought there. What I really wanna do is move forward now and talk about how we drill leverage. Okay. now talk about how we drill leverage, okay, physical leverage. Not, not, we're going to move on from positional leverage. And we start off with our footwork. So, look, th this first step that you're going to see an offensive player take, this is Eric Fisher, our first round pick uh, out of Central Michigan a couple of years ago. We call that step a position step. Okay, is it a bucket step? Is it a drop step? Yes, it might be. A position step to us is going to be whatever it needs to be. Okay, it might be a pick it up and put it down. In, a, in the power game, it might be a gap step. So whatever that step, when I, when I first started coaching, some coaches really flinched at the idea of a drop step. What, we're going to go backwards to block someone? Uh, so we didn't call it a drop step. We called it a positional step. Problem solved. Okay? Positional step, whatever it needs to be. All right? And then what, what you're going to see uh, Fish do here is set his angle, it's about a 45, we're just, we said, hey, it's an it's a inside zone here. Let's come running off the ball. So this idea of running off the ball was introduced to me by my first line coach, a guy named Joe Moore, okay? Joe Moore, as many of you know, is a legend, legendary offensive line coach. And he was a big believer that offensive linemen are athletes. He would tell us. Okay. And I only played for Joe for one year, but he profoundly affected me in the way I think about offensive line play. Because I was a tight end, and I, well, I'll tell you, I was a tight end, and when Joe came to Notre Dame, he said, uh, I was a junior, and he, I was entering my senior year, and he said, uh, Andy, would you like to play in the NFL? And I said, yes, coach, I want to play in the NFL. And he said, well, you will not make it as a tight end. You're not a very good tight end. You're not fast. You can't catch. Okay, you need to come with me. So uh, that was a, a wake-up call. So, I mean, no question about it. Joe's a straight, a straight shooter now. So went down to the equipment room, changed out an 80 number for a 60 number, started going to Joe's meetings. First thing he said to us is, look, you guys are athletes. 
So we're, we're going to do things that are athletic. When we move, we're going to move in an athletic way. If there's anything that we're doing that doesn't look natural, okay, that's not, we're not going to do that. So he started with when we're running our zone uh, concept, we're going to run off the football. Okay, now you do have to have a little bit of a base. It's not literally like you're running a 40-yard dash, but we're going to run off the ball. Imagine if uh, Fish is a uh, right guard, okay, and he's got a three technique on him, a tight three technique. Well, that three technique is the read, okay? If we told him, you've got that guy man to man, he's yours and only yours, and that guy spiked on him one time, is, Fish ain't going to run off the ball anymore. He is all of a sudden going to uh, have caution in his game. So we'll do things with our zone game that will protect him. Okay? An uncovered lineman is going to peek him. He's going to know he's protected. He's going to run off the football. Okay? Because if he runs off the football, and we're going to talk about how to run off the football. If he runs off the football, okay, he's going to like the results most of the time. If he plays with caution, is this guy going to spike? He's never going to like the results. So we, we want to constantly instill confidence in these guys. And we've got to do that when we correct them and coach them, too. We can't say, you, you, you know, you screwed that up. You've got to do this. You got, you know, every once in a while, when you're running off the ball, when you're throwing, uh, when you're taking caution out of the game and letting these guys cut it loose, okay, every once in a while, you're going to have to live with, hey, that's okay. That's okay. We'll, we'll get it the next time. Probably the answer was you're, you took too big, too big a step somewhere. Okay, we, we got to just shorten up our steps. So we give them a little answer. Okay, don't worry about that. We'll get the next one. Okay, let, don't coach caution into the game. Let him run off the ball. So he's going to take a position step, set the angle, run off the football. Now we'd like to have low pad level through about three yards when we do this. Okay, there's uh, Zach Fulton out of Tennessee. We saw his picture on the screen last night. Okay, he's running off the football. Okay, now, what's Zach doing here? Uh, this is Gallup footwork, and I haven't, hadn't always uh, taught this, so we'd be reaching a three technique, and we'd say, look, you've got to make contact on the second step, all right? And it was a few years ago at this clinic, I'm sure I heard Coach Callahan or Coach McNally talk about this footwork, uh, this, this idea of shuffling over, and it started even a few years before that when I heard Coach Zerline talking about Gallup footwork as it was applied in the power game, whether it was the duo play or one back power. So we, we went back, I went back, I had reviewed my notes, and I said, man, that's going to be a great way to help our double teams, help be more square on our double teams. And it did. It improved our double teams in our power game. And then I heard as I said, uh, coaches here at this clinic talking about using similar type footwork to arrive at a blocking point. And I thought, man, that just makes too much sense, okay? Because what we're doing, when, a, when I've got a player off my frame, okay, he's a wide three, he's a wide five, a wide nine, he's off my frame, what I'm doing is just taking a little extra two steps and then I'm beginning the whole process over again of running off the football on the same angle. I arrive at that junction point, I arrive at that defender, okay, to same foot, same shoulder him, in a better coil, in a better position of leverage, as opposed to in a bad football position. Okay? So we'll talk more about coil as we go here. <clears throat> Some of the ways that we, we drill leverage, because uh, really that's all football is. Again, whether you're talking positional or uh, physical leverage, pass pro or run blocking. When I first started coaching in Jacksonville, I inherited a, a line that was pretty darn good at running the football. Okay? We had two uh, Polynesian guards, Chris Naoli and Vince Manawai, 330 pounds apiece, and they just mowed people off the ball. They mowed him off the ball. Had an experienced center in Brad Meester, who played 16 years in the league. Okay, knew how to make all the calls, understood leverage, played great. Okay, and had Mo Williams from Michigan at right tackle, and then we had Khalif Barnes at left tackle, who was the youngster of the group. At any rate, we went out, we had some great success running the ball, we protected the quarterback pretty well, and I thought, man, this is easy. This coaching the O-line is pretty easy. Those guys made it easy for me. When I played for Russ Grimm, he used to talk about, look, I, I want you guys to know what you're doing on Sunday so that when you go out there, I can just sit back and drink a coat and eat a hot dog. Okay? 
He, now, of course, he wouldn't do that, but what his point was, you guys got this, okay? I'm going to give you uh, the tools to use, make you confident. You guys got this, and I felt that way. Then a couple of years later, we drafted two young tackles, Eugene Monroe and Evan Britton, and they started for us on opening day in Indianapolis, okay? Left and right tackle, okay? And I quickly found out this shit is not easy, okay? <laughs> This is not, this is, okay, now I got to, I actually have to develop these guys. I got to teach them how to do something. And one of the things that they needed how to do was learn how to run block with great leverage. So I added this drill. We went right back to the beginning, just the six-point explosion. And then when you look at this, this is Ricky Henry here out of Nebraska, okay, this explosion, this uh, business of driving the hips forward, okay, creating that arch, okay, having our feet. We'll talk about them being underneath us, but yeah, I can see where they're behind you. Depends on what angle you're looking at here. Okay, so we started uh, training, driving the belt buckle into the defender in order to create this hit and lift. Okay, so I had to back up a step and go back and just let them experience what does this feel like, okay, to put, you know, my old high school coach used to say, put the pecker on the pad. Put the pecker on the pad. Okay, hit and lift. Take it for a Saturday night ride. Okay, uh, I worked with a, a guy named Ron Prince who's now in Detroit, and he talked about, okay, here's what it feels like. Okay, we talk about cracking the walnut, and he'd say, put a walnut, imagine that Ricky's got a walnut right between his cheeks there. Okay, and he's going to drive his hips forward and he's going to crack that walnut. Okay, so if you can think of that sensation, okay, he's, he's going to go ahead and get fully deep in on that block with a hitting and lifting. This next drill, uh, we used to do this when I played for Hudson. Okay, we just call it fit and explode. I go ahead and let them fit up with their hands, but imagine that uh, Larry here has taken his position step. He's taken his first position step. He's got his second step on the ground. Remember, we were targeting our second step to the near foot. So his second step's to the near foot, his hat's tight outside, and all we're going to do is unlock our hips, drive our hip forward, crack the walnut. Okay, and one of the things that you're looking at, you, you see a great arch in his back, okay, great strength, great leverage. There's the hit and the lift. His eyes are up, his hands are inside, his feet are underneath. Okay, Joe Moore was a huge fan of the boxing game. And he likened offensive line play to the boxing game. He would talk to us about Mike Tyson, who, who was taking uh, the world by storm at that time when Joe was coaching us. And the first thing that I wrote in my book, besides be an athlete, was, okay, if you don't learn anything else, there's going to be three things occurring on any block you make whether it's run or pass, and that's going to be your eyes will be up, you're going to be seeing what you're hitting, your hands are going to be inside, inside hands are going to win, and your feet are going to be underneath you. In other words, I'm not going to be in a position where I've been at the waist where I can easily fall out the window, be pulled out of balance, or if I'm protecting in this way, I become a rotator, okay, as opposed to a guy that can move either direction laterally. So eyes up, hands inside, feet underneath. And they're not literally underneath your shoulders, they're oftentimes underneath your hips. And then if I get a little bit of a lean here, it's still underneath, it's nice and in line. That's a nice in line. The other thing that you see here is it is literally in line as opposed to a knee buckling out here to the side with energy going this way and that way. Okay, that, that foot is drawing energy from the ground. So how do our guys train in the weight room, right? They're doing things like squatting. They're doing things like cleaning. They're drawing energy from the ground. So this idea of using the ground and getting a maximum leverage out of that ground, okay? And that's also going to lend itself to playing with your cleats in the ground, okay? All of your cleats in the ground, not on your toe. Let's get our feet in the ground. Let's draw energy from that ground. Let's get it in line. Let's run off the ball, crack the walnut, and we're going to roll some some bitches out of here. This right tackle, okay, Ryan Harris, he's a Notre Dame guy, not a big guy. He's about 300 pounds, okay, and he's got a Super Bowl ring now because he left us, went to uh, Denver, got him a Super Bowl ring. 
But Ryan stepped in and started for us at right tackle, and he's not a great run blocker, but he bought into the idea of when I'm reaching a wide technique, I'm going to use Gallup footwork. I'm going to cover some ground so that when I can make him that tight shade on me, I'm going to cover some ground, arrive at that block in a coil, and so you'll see Ryan gallop a little bit here <clears throat> to the defensive end, and then when he makes contact, he's in that same body position we just saw Larry in. Okay, and he's going to crack the walnut with a hit and lift, same foot, same shoulder, and he's able to lift the guy out of his shoes, put him on the ground. So we go to the end zone, we see Ryan, he's got a guy off his frame, we're running inside zone, so let's go ahead and let's cover a little bit of that ground with a little gallop footwork so that when I get there, and really what we're trying to do is say, don't take uh, long strides because when you get there, you'll be in no position to lever off of that thing. Take shorter steps, get there, arrive in a coil, and now I can unlock my hips and hit and lift, eyes up, hands inside, feet underneath, and all this work is being done off of a same foot, same shoulder principle, okay? It is also a good picture of a shotgun run of our right guard, Zach Fulton here, uh, just uh, stepping back here for a minute, talking about relative position, okay? As he blocks this guy, you know, some years ago, I would have said, man, you got to get your hat tight outside. Well, it is tight outside of the cylinder of that defender as it relates to that runner, okay? He is outside of that guy, and he's moving that cat, okay? He's running off the football, getting his second step down, keeping his eyes up, hands inside, feet underneath. He's reading this defender right here. Yeah. As if he's in the dot and that's the right guard and that's the three technique. Yeah. That, he's going to feel, he, he, he's still, the power of that play is still going to be that backside three. He's going to sink it on that center. So here's a picture of our center, and now it's Zach Fulton again. If you take a look at the center, he's slipping through, uh, through a nose guard. He arrives at the second level in a good body position, a good uh, feet underneath him, eyes up, hands inside, feet underneath, hit and lift, rolls a, a, a linebacker out of there. Okay. <clears throat> so we've got an inside zone to the right. We've got a dot run, so these angles are a little bit bigger. I'd like to see him gallop and get hat tight outside because of where the runner is. Okay, don't even look at the right tackle, but what we're looking at is the hit and lift by the center. And it is a good picture, too, of the backside tackle of getting on his angle. He's using a little bit of gallop footwork. Okay? I'd like to, him to get a little bit thicker on this guy, but he's going to run him on that angle. The idea there is we'd like to block people, whether it's a linebacker or a down lineman, on the angle that we found him. All right. at, a, at a certain point, will we torque him? Sure. Okay. But rather than, and it will be a tendency of a backside tackle, to try to restrict that guy from holding his gap. And as soon as he does that, he's got energy going this way and that way. We've got a running back shoulders. We want, our, we want to stay on that same angle. He wants to play that gap. Then we'll just take him further than he wants to go. It would just make sense that I'm not as strong doing this as if I just get in line and just drive on that angle. So that's what you see in the, the left tackle do here. Okay, in this picture we're looking at the right guard. This is uh, Rashad Johnson. Okay, so he's going to take a position step, get his second step in the ground as quickly as he can. We'd like for contact to be made on that second step. That's when we'd like that thing to be getting in the ground, which is why we're going to align with a little bit of depth. We'll put our guard's hands on the shoelaces of the center, and that's why that first step might be a little bit of a drop step. So we can gain, we'll lose a little ground to gain some of that leverage we're talking about. 
but he just drives on that angle, eyes up, hands inside, feet underneath. Okay, I don't let my hips get behind me, again, to where I could be pulled out the window. I want to constantly try to bring my hips up underneath me, and he's able to crumble the three technique. All right, so we just call this hand switch. This, we oftentimes use this at the beginning of practice, both as a warm-up, but also as a tool to teach leverage. <clears throat> The first time I ever met with uh, Joe Moore, and he talked about eyes up, hands inside, feet underneath, he did uh, something similar to what Coach McNally showed us with that uh, sumo uh, drill we were looking. He'd take the biggest guy in the room, the smallest guy in the room, and just make a simple demonstration. And as a tight end who had just been taught, use arm pump, and the harder you pump those arms, you're, gonna, you're just going to uh, bludgeon that guy to death. And then all of a sudden I'm being taught, no, no, just get your hands inside. You're, if you get your hands inside, you're going to win this deal. And so he just did something simple like this uh, for us to illustrate that. So all we're doing is, hey, we've lost our leverage. We're going to quickly regain that leverage. And then the other thing is, when you talk, one thing I've picked up along the way, you talk about pad level. Okay, low pads win. I would submit to you that it's not necessarily the pad level, but which player has lower hips? Okay, whose hips are lower? Okay, here, here we can see clearly uh, Mitch's hips are lower than Collins. He's got leverage. His eyes are up, his hands are inside. He's going to crack the walnut. Now, what happens once I've cracked the walnut? I've lost my coil. So what I've got to do is I've got to regain coil. How do you do that? You've got to drop your hips. So you've got to widen and quicken your feet to drop those hips, regain your coil, start the process again. Okay, I feel my hands out, get them in, drop the hips, low hips are uh, gonna win this deal. So all we're doing is transitioning here. So when we hit the crowd there, all we're doing now is just conditioning ourselves to, to feel that sweet spot, that contact being made on the second step. So we're gonna take a position step this could be a left guard working a 2-I with his center. Okay, this is a center. He might be working a backside uh, scoop block. But what we're looking for is a little position step. If we were to lead step and make contact, there we would not have our right, right foot under this right shoulder. I'm looking at the left guard in this picture. If I were to lead step and make contact, I don't have this right foot under, under my right shoulder like I would if I could just take a little position step Put that foot in the ground. Now I can same foot, same shoulder that thing and lever him up in the air with a hit and lift. Uh, one of the ways I, I think of it is if I'm standing and I'm going to do a vertical jump with my feet planted in the ground, okay, I'm not going to be able to jump as high as if I could just take one step into that, gain a little bit of momentum and jump. Okay, that's going to, that little position step is going to give me that little momentum to get my second step in the ground, make contact. Then when we unlock the hips, we'd like to see this all in line. Okay, again, if my knee's way out here and then I got energy going this way, I'd like it all going vertically right through that bag. So really, we're just going to uh, position step, second step, contact, hit and lift. Okay, hit and lift, and then a couple steps, we're going to break them, drop the, drop the uh, sled. So we've gone six point, we went hand switch, we went uh, crowther. This is... Same thing. We're just drilling the same thing over and over again. And what we found is that we're, we're teaching the same thing over and over again, whether we're talking our zone game, our power game. When we're talking our run game, we're, we're practicing about three, four different blocks. And we practice them over and over again. Okay, so whether fish is stepping over the towel, second step to the near foot, there's a nice inline picture of him, uh, shoulder behind his hip, behind his, uh, his ankle behind his hip, behind his shoulder, inline running off the football. Okay, Zach, same thing. Second step to the near foot, nice and inline. That's going to, again, be way more powerful than if he left that foot way back here and he had some funky angles going on, hitting and lifting. Okay, you can see here, Larry, he tends to leave that foot behind here. So that foot right there, he's got energy going this way and that. Not as powerful as the last picture we just saw with Zach. Okay, where Zach's getting that thing down in the ground. And that is going to be way more powerful, drawing way more energy from the ground. Okay, one more look at it. 
Uh, this is Mitchell Schwartz, who we just got from Cleveland. Okay, I'm excited to start working with him. So I've got a defender off the frame. Again, we're running inside zone. So I'm going to cover a little bit of ground, just like we saw Ryan Harris do against San Diego. And then I'm going to arrive in a good football position. Now, we would like, we're going to get Mitch to get his hips up underneath him a little more. Okay, the, this, he's in danger of falling out the window in this picture. Okay, probably because the defender is too soft and he's giving up too much ground there. Okay, this is a good picture of Zach. Okay, whether he's a right guard reaching a nose guard, whether he's a left guard reaching a wide three, okay, he's going to be doing the same thing. We'll use the same footwork on down blocks. We'll use this gallop footwork that we started way back when for our dual play, for our power play. We're doing it all over the place. We're, get, we're keeping our feet underneath us, our hips underneath us, so we can be in a nice coil and unload on these suckers. Okay. Fish reaching a uh, five technique. Fish is a guy that's got to, he's got to work on his, his hand placement. Uh, when I was training in, uh, as a player in Seattle, we got to do some martial arts uh, training, and a guy <clears throat> talked about economy of motion. So we, we would like to eliminate as much of the wind-up as we can. We'd like to go right now with our hands inside. That would be a perfect world. Now, there's going to be a little bit of arm movement. That, that's okay. We're, but we don't want to be big wind-up, give people the filet. This, to a D lime in this chest area, filet mignon, right? They're just going to eat that up. So we're going to keep our hands tight, shoot that thing in there. Uh, economy of motion, no wasted motion. So a fish is a guy who in his background has been a, very, a really uh, forklifting guy, okay, up and under. And there's some value to that, but he's doing it uh, to a point that he's not getting that good triangle, that hat and hands in that sweet spot on contact. Okay, so we're working on him just shooting those things a little bit tighter, that hat and hands, a little bit higher for him and not giving the defense that filet mignon. Okay. Another good picture here. This is about right that we we're talking about with our guard here. This is Jeff Allen. Okay, I would like to see his elbows in tight, but not a lot of wasted motion there. This drill right here. Now, when when I played for Joe Moore in college, we did pretty much uh, one thing in individual, and and that was this drill. We would be in full pads, and it was a sumo drill. Defender may have hand, had his hand in the dirt. I've adapted it for you know many camps, off-season training, or, or days where maybe we're not in full pads. We'll do it in full pads as well. And the idea of this drill, this defender is going to do everything in his power okay, to stone this offensive player. He's going to use his hands. He's going to use leverage. He's like you know a two-gap and nose guard, a two-gap, a two-gap and four-eye technique. He's going to do everything he can to stop this offensive player. So now the offensive player is forced to use all those things we've been working on. Eyes up, hands inside, feet underneath. I feel my hand out, I gotta get it back in. Okay, I've lost my coil. I've gotta widen and quicken my feet so I can drop my hips, regain my coil. And this is a competitive physical drill, but at the same time, there's no collision. You can do this drill with no, with no helmets on. Okay, so it's competitive. And the offensive player will say, you'll initiate the drill. We don't give him a snap count, okay? The offensive player initiates a drill, so he'll get initial hands inside. And then the defender has to do everything he can. Of course, we're, we're, we're going to get on the defender if he's brother-in-law in this thing, okay? If he's union and up and just kind of letting him walk back, we're going to get on his ass, we're gonna, and we're going to make him do it again. If they give us a good rep here, then we're going to stop right there with that rep. In fact, with Joe, we learned that. Uh, quickly, so you know, we'd go through the line, and we'd have basically a fist fight. Boom, okay, we, it balls out on that thing, and we'd be done. And we, he'd have a 15-minute individual, and Joe said, "Okay, you do it right," and then we're done. And we'd stand around and we'd drink water, okay, with Joe. But he wanted that shit done right, right there. And then Coach Holtz would be over in the corner, he'd be looking over at Joe in the old line, and we'd be standing around drinking water. Joe's drinking, uh, smoking a cigarette. And be like, hey, Joe, let's get, get some work done over there. They'd be like, I, I, I got it. We love that, okay? And we were a wishbone team. Now, the next individual we had, all we did was work on pass pro. I think we threw it six times that whole year. But he was work, we worked on pass pro over there with Joe. Okay, but this drill right here, uh, love this drill, especially if we're getting ready to play uh, a 34 team, which we're see, we are seeing less and less of. Okay, this man right here, Stephen Baker, is 360 plus pounds. 
Okay, and then Rodney goes about 303. So this would illustrate good leverage, eyes up, hands inside. And then again, whoever's got the lowest hips is going to be the guy that's going to be able to grind him out. And if Rodney gets his feet too far behind him, he gets too much uh, weight out in front of him, right? He's going to be able to be thrown out the window. Once he loses his coil, he's got to drop his hips, get his feet back up underneath him. Okay. But you can see where a smaller man using proper leverage can move a big one out of there. Okay, this is Colin Kelly, uh, undrafted free agent out of Oregon State, and tremendous leverage. Treme great job with his eyes up, his hands inside, and constantly trying to climb his belt buckle up on that defender for that hit and lift. Okay. And if that drill, that sumo drill, we ask the defender to stone him okay, in line and make the offensive player use leverage, this drill... Okay, and we, I got this drill from Tony Wise. Though, Tony, when we did this, I think we started 10 yards apart and with a huge collision, and then we got into this drill. Um, so we, we, we've gone ahead and got fit up on this thing. And what we're training is, okay, what do I do when the defender is now trying to disengage to go make the tackle? I've got to have a feel for anticipating that. Uh, and regaining leverage. So now we're going to ask the defender not to just stone him in place, and the defender will initiate this drill. <clears throat> That's a five-yard square there. And he's going to do everything he can to dodge, stay out of the way, stay, and keep from getting driven out of this box. Okay, so we call this Tar Heel drill after the old four corners Tar Heel basketball. Okay, so fish... And if these guys get narrow, again, the, uh, anticipating body movement, okay, th this, this is going to occur on game day. Usually once I've got about two, three steps into a block, that guy ain't going to just stay blocked. He's going to try to pad back. He's going to try to disengage. So getting a good feel for that. This, this is a pretty good clip here by Colin. Okay, I feel, I feel like I'm losing leverage. Go ahead, get that hand back inside. But it is, a, there you go, good, good job of getting his hips lower than his, widening quick in the feet, get him out of the box. So we've got a clip here, I think this is the center uh, reaching a nose guard uh, using the drill we, we were just looking at here. So he, he's got a little assist there on, on a uh, scoop block on that nose guard. Now the nose guard's trying to pad back, he's got to drop his hips, anticipate him trying to pad back, drops, it, drops his hips and finishes him. Let's see. We can see him a little better from the end zone. Okay, he's got the block going. At this point, that guy's not going to just stay blocked. So now I'm starting to get my feet gathered up pretty good. I'm ready to adjust my hips and go finish that block. That's Mitch Morse, our rookie last year out of uh, Missouri. Excited about Mitch. Now, that we're looking at a power play here, but it's also a Tar Heel block. And... You know, we'll freeze, we'll freeze the tape off and, and we'll, we'll ask the guys, okay, what's Mitch doing right here? What's the center doing right here as this defender tries to disengage and go make that play? Okay, well, he's doing the Tar Heel drill. And we're trying in doing these drills to drill things we want to see on Sunday okay, or on Saturday, right? We're not just drilling to drill. We're drilling specific things that we want to see showing up on tape. And if you look across that tape, what you should be seeing is 11 individual drills going on, okay? So we make the guys believers, you know, we try to illustrate for them, yeah, look, at, there, there goes Mitch, he's, he's doing the Tar Heel drill, he's finishing, Larry's powder, okay? So 11 individual drills going on all over the field. Okay, th this is not a very good run, didn't make many yards, but it was a good picture of our right guard, and, and you know, I've mentioned Larry now a couple times. I've got to tell you, this guy is a special individual. Larry Duvernay Tardif is uh, French Canadian, uh, speaks French, uh, barely speaks English, and we drafted him in the sixth round. He went to McGill College. So I remember they said, take a look at this guy, Laurent Duvernay Tardif, at a McGill College. We, we didn't have any tape. Have we got any McGill guys here? No, they did their pro day in the bar, remember? Pro day in the bar? Yeah, they did. It, well, I didn't know a thing about it, and so I started watching Larry, and one thing I knew, I knew is he's a tough son of a gun. Now, uh, McGill's great, got a great medical school. Larry is uh, a doctor. He, he's, uh, in fact, when, the day that we drafted him, he was in the OR delivering twins. So we called him. He, he scrubbed out, took the call. We drafted him. 
a uh, big strong guy but we've had to really teach him a lot you know he everything whether it's uh, things like uh, the language barrier um, and, and he's learned more and more as we've gone along we talked about our, our word for uh, fan block was uh, oh you got to ice that you got two guys out there you got to ice that he's like coach uh, what is ice and I said uh, it's a fan you just fan it and he was like like the fan what do you what so uh, it became apparent to me okay how much we got to teach this guy we got to teach him how to run he runs like a Canadian okay it, <laughs> But he, he, he caught on to this Tar Heel business, dropped the hip, and uh, coach calls him baby rhinoceros. I mean, you would talk about a bull in a china shop. I mean, he's just, every time you look over, somebody's falling down, getting smushed, okay, Larry's involved. Okay. The guys call him the Dos Equis man, the most interesting man in the world. I think, besides being a doctor, speaking like three languages, plays the guitar, I think he spent two years at sea, uh, you know, hunting or fishing for his food, fighting off pirates. Doing, okay. <laughs>
Okay, we're going to take care of the downs. We don't want to be bouncing off of that thing and getting split, uh, hurrying to that linebacker. Okay, until that linebacker's alignment forces us to do that. And now, again, it's not a hurry off to it, but I do have to be aware of where the running back is, what zone have we called, what's my relative position. Okay. So we'd call that a crowd. It is a shoulder block. I, I believe in striking that thing with the shoulder and then climbing that thing uh, through as opposed to uh, using the hand. I think that's going to be uh, stronger. And then this player right here, the uncovered player, your aiming point is the V of that neck. When I first started playing for Tony, and I had just come over from Seattle, we had zoned a particular way where as a tackle I might o overtake that three technique. And at any rate, we doing a drill similar to this. Uh, let's slip this guy, let's scoop this guy. And Tony would say, not physical enough. You know, he's looking at the tape of me, not physical enough. And as a player, steam is coming out of my ears. Not physical enough? Okay, so I'm, next day I'm gonna come out here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna scream off this ball. I'm gonna hit this guy as hard as I can. Not physical enough. And I did not for the life of me understand uh, what Tony meant, and then he, he, drew, he went up to the board and he drew a circle, and then he drew a line right through that via the neck, and as opposed to scooping and overtaking and again fighting this way, which I had come from in my previous team, but taking that guy on the angle that I found him and driving through the via the neck, okay, I did that. It wasn't a function of going harder or meaner or faster, it was a function of my angle. And as soon as I figured that out, and he helped me out with that picture, uh, and I had a visual, then he said, that's it, that's, that's physical, that's good. Next, okay, so thank goodness my coach didn't think I wasn't physical anymore. So through the V of the neck, that's a little bit too far by Rodney. We'd like to, and we're going to take that guy again for a ride. We've got 600 on 300 right here. Okay, we're not going to be rushing off the linebackers. Okay, eventually we're going to block them. But we'll take care of first levels first. Again, it does not matter what position I'm playing, left, right, okay, it could be a tackle working a C block with the tight end, in this case, center, left guard, okay, so Rodney getting that uh, uh, same foot, same shoulder principle, drive the shoulder through, okay, as opposed to allowing the defender to pry me open, okay, offside player through the V of the neck and take him on the angle you found him. Okay, we want to take him off the ball on the angle that I found him. And we would describe if we've gone too far, we've overshot that thing, okay, as being sack over cheek, right? We'd have sack over cheek. Okay, that's, that's too far. We don't want to be pushing our guy. We want all that energy on the defender. Okay, don't, don't push our guy through. Let's be pushing the defender. Okay, again, you can see Larry leaving that foot behind him a little bit. That is not as strong as that last picture we saw with Jeff with that foot in line. Okay, he is hitting and lifting, powering the shoulder through. Okay, Jeff is, is trying to push him through. Let, let's not shove our guys. Okay, let, let's make sure we're shoving those down guys. Okay, there's the gallop footwork. Well, as an uncovered lineman, whether I'm a center, guard, tackle, I could go ahead and use that gallop footwork. Now, uh, Pugs here... This, Gerard Pugsley out of Akron, he's a little bit uh, twisted and leaned, but he's arriving at that block okay, in a good coil to now drive on that angle through the V of the neck. Okay, so here, here again, we're, we're, we're going to look at a drill occurring on the field. So this is a single block between the left guard and the center. We're going to take this two-eye technique and we're going to roll him out of there. All right, now this is a tackle playing guard. We, we, we were down in numbers and we had to take a tackle Donald Stevenson and line him up in there and guard so his footwork's not great. But it should be position step, second step with his second step contact made with his right foot. And we're going to drive that guy on the angle we found him, okay? And motor him out of there. Okay, watching the right guard and the center here. Okay, this is just the slip and scoop drill going on. Same thing by our center and right guard. Let's take care of the down guy. So we got a gun inside zone. Runner's going to sink it to the inside leg of the center. We're going to uh, be able to get hip to hip on that deal okay, by using Crowther footwork. Okay, and our center here, 
Uh, we'd like for him to be as square as he possibly can, especially as this defender gets more uh, to a head up position. But as long as he's out here stacked, stacked in that B gap, then we can keep just grinding on that down guy. Okay, uh, now we're looking at the center left guard. Okay, they're, they're doing the same things over and over again. Okay, so now they've got a slip and scoop drill going on. He's doing the same thing that the left guard was doing on the last play. He's doing the same thing the center was doing on the last play. Okay, we're looking at the left guard in the center on this uh, dot run inside zone. Okay, we've got our fullback uh, lead play on, on the wheel backer. Okay, that's a slip and a scoop. Now, a uh, you know, Mike McGlynn ends up folding over a little bit. More, as much a product of that defensive in, uh, nose tackle twisting. Okay, we'd like to be driving right through the V of his neck. Okay, and Rodney takes the hip away just a little bit and ends up having to lean back, but he at least pried that shoulder open, okay, as opposed to bouncing off. As long as he can get that defender's shoulder turned, okay, which is again a function of hitting and lifting, driving that thing through, and then take the backer on the angle you found him. Okay, this is a good picture. So, you know, we'll have to eventually, when we, when we train our running game, and this is just something that I believe in, you know, we get, uh, these guys will get a, basically a nine on seven period. Because when we get the team, we'll, we'll sprinkle in a run or two, but really our nine on seven period. So they might get one run uh, one way. And hopefully we can get one uh, for the other side going the other way. After that, it's going to be picked up in walkthrough. So, when they get that one run, I do not like to script uh, a worst case scenario. I don't like to script, you know, a blitz. Okay, I like to, unless that's exactly what they normally do. You know, percentages tell me uh, that if we get into regular personnel, they're going to run cross dog on us. Th then we'll script that. But otherwise, we're going to script their base look. Look, they're an under team. They're going to play this coverage. Okay, that's the look I'm going to give them because I want them to come running off the ball with confidence. I don't want caution. All right. Then later in the week, we'll cover it in a walkthrough. Okay, the what if. Okay, how are you going to handle this? What call are you going to make? Uh, the adjustment. But uh, typically don't like to do that full speed because of the limited reps. I want these guys screaming off the ball, walking on the field. Okay, like Joe Moore used to tell us uh, when he talked about Mike Tyson. Okay, if you guys can remember some of those fights. Okay, here comes the first fighter, the challenger. He's got his entourage. He's got the, the silk, uh, colorful outfits. Okay, and then here comes Tyson walking in the ring. Okay, black trunks, black shoes, white towel over his head, no music. And he walked in, and he knew, and that guy knew, and every guy in the arena knew who was going to win that fight. Okay, so that's how I want these guys walking on the field. Okay, I want them walking on the field feeling like freaking King Kong. They're going to whip the world. So I don't want to build caution into their game. I'm going to script them the look they're going to see, okay? Because that's the rep they're going to get, and then we're on to the next thing. Okay, so here the slips and scoops, but we do eventually have to talk about, okay, what happens when the guy disappears? Now, what we're doing here is by using Gallup footwork, we're able to spend a little bit of time on the line of scrimmage. If I'm stepping with big steps into the line of scrimmage, I'm not able to handle movement as well. So I've used this Gallup footwork. I've got myself nice and gathered. We, sit, we talk about use it, spend some time on the line of scrimmage so you can sort these things out, and then we'll ask our left guard here to swell up on this thing. And then turn that thing, oh shoot, there's a slip and scoop on that cat now. Now, now we're doing the drill. Okay, uh, left, uh, right guard and center, working the nose guard. Nose guard gets knocked across. I'm going to stay on the angle that I found my backer. I'm not necessarily trying to knock him across. We're trying to take that guy for a Saturday night ride right there. Okay, he ends up playing across the face. I climb my backer, take him on the angle I found him. Okay, Rodney staying nice and in line, running that guy on the end and crumbles him.
Okay, uh, just real quick here. Here, here, here. Now I've got a, a linebacker, right? When we were drilling this thing, he is backside. Now, now we can see where he is. We still need to give a little bit of help on this B block, on this backside scoop block, but rather than a crowd there now, that's going to be a lever, and that's dictated there by that linebacker's alignment. It could also be dictated by the track of the back. Again, if we were in... Um, a mid zone or an outside zone, I don't care where that backer is, that's going to be a lever. Okay, it's never going to be a crowther. It's going to be a lever. Okay, inside zone, it's going to be a crowther till I've got to make it a lever. Okay, and just like we saw the center swell up, and we're, you know, this is something that I've had to learn how to handle as we've implemented the read game into our offense, which is something I had never been exposed to before, you know, this whole spill and scrape business. So the tackle, uh, he, he, he smells a rat right here. He knows it's going to be a give all the way with two outside. All right, but we still would start, you know, for a TE, a pirate, possibly this guy just starts moving and he's got that gap. So he's going to start his scoop block. It's disappearing, get ready to swell up. Okay, give us a hash there. Okay, when we get a bare front, which we get a ton of, whether it's, you know, an under that plays like a bear, or uh, a 34 that plays like a bear, or just a straight bear, okay, we, we get a ton of that. So on our, on our inside zone, we do say, look, we're going to favor, especially a gun inside zone, we're going to favor that B block, all right? But these three men right here are zone blocking these three right here, he, quarterback's handling him, all right? So we would like for uh, Larry here to use a little bit of gallop footwork. We definitely would not like him to get his left hand involved here, on this block. He should be keeping that thing uh, free. I'd like to see him use a little bit of gallop. It might be a crowther, okay, depending on how that three plays. It might be a lever. It also might be that he's got to quickly turn that into what we call a slush zone with your center. So we'd say, look, inside zone, favor the B block, but so we call it a B slush. He's ready to turn that thing into a slush. Okay, same thing going the other way here. This is going to be a B slush. Now, that, that linebacker's alignment could dictate there ain't no B involved, all right? But uh, the more he gets o over top uh, of me in that back, that should be a B slush. This is exactly correct, what we're looking for from the footwork. He's prepared to turn that into a B or into an A with his uh, center. Okay, we'd like for the center to be a little bit thicker on that and not get twisted as much. It was a nice job by the guard. Okay, so mo moving on, I just wanted to talk to you guys about some alternative techniques that you might use on the, particularly the backside of um, mid, mid zone. All right, so when we're talking inside zone, we, we are not cut blocking, right? We're all staying up. But on the backside of our mid zone or outside zone, now we're going to ask the guys, let's, let's get these guys cut down. Let's reduce them physically. So uh, cut block and, and other techniques, what, what do I do when I can't cut block them? So I did want to show one clip because a couple of years ago, it might have been last year, uh, the officials came in and they wanted to clarify to us. They said, look, uh, when we're cut blocking, when you're cut blocking, we're going to pay particular attention to how you're getting the guy on the ground. And we're going to be looking for specifically players that are rolling into the backs of legs. We don't want that. We're going to start flagging that. We're going to call that. Okay, so that has, that has, that's separate from what you may have read about, heard about uh, for, for this year's emphasis. So the reason I show that is that, that is not what we teach, right? That, that's a penalty. So we're gonna, we've got to get this guy cut on the ground okay, in a way that we can reduce him physically, make him get back up off the ground, but we're not rolling into the back of his legs. All right, so th this, yes, sir. The new rule uh, says that they're not going to allow chop blocks. Now, 
chop blocks really have never have been allowed except by an adjacent lineman. And we're talking there literally about a high-low. I post a guy up and an, another guy takes him out. So when they said, okay, the chop blocks are out, you know, Joe uh, Public is reading, oh, and there's no more cut blocking. Cut blocking is still allowed. They want to eliminate literally holding a guy up and chopping him. Now, as long, now what about those times when I'm trying to get through to my backer? Can I, can I touch that guy? Yeah. As it was explained to me, as long as they're making an attempt, and I believe this is the same as a college rule, as long as they're making an attempt to get to that second level or the next defender, we can still cut him. Okay, so for me that meant, in terms of what we teach, business as usual, we're still going to be working our same techniques. All right, so our technique is, we, we call it a calf tap in the way we drill it. And, you know, I, I had been looking for a way to drill cut blocking. And uh, the, I think Pete Metzlars and um, possibly Howard were doing this in Indianapolis. Ron Prince brought it to me in Jacksonville. And I thought it was a great way. It's something we can do, you know, in a phase uh, two. We just got to use coaches over there. It's something we can do during a special teams period. Uh, a little bit after practice, it's got a conditioning element to it. But the idea is, here's a left tackle, could be a center, anybody. I've got to get that guy cut down. So we're going to start him two yards in front of him, just start walking him. And it's usually on the fourth or the sixth step that this cut's going to occur. So I thought that was great last night when I was hearing about those landmarks where that's going to occur because I had always spoken in terms of how, how many steps. Basically, I was saying uh, we're not going to take one step and throw a shoe duster. Okay, we're, we're, This block is going to happen way over there, usually on the fourth or sixth step. We would like on that step to get our hat through north and south Okay, we would like for it to be same foot, same shoulder, and we'd like to drive, hit and lift that shoulder through the inside knee. Okay, that shoulder through the inside knee and eyes up. All right, so, and then when we do this drill, we like to play under the table as we go. We don't want to stand straight up and then have to dip underneath that. So it, there's more of a hit and lift. So we will uh, like to drag that hand on the ground, and then we'll, we'll get some contact. We'll tap the calf. So we've drilled this, and we went into our first preseason game, and somebody went through there, and they tapped the calf of the defender. And I said, oh, shit. They did just what we drilled. And I said, no, it, we're simulating cutting. Okay, you, I want you to cut that guy. I don't want you to literally tap his calf. But okay, so I didn't know. But I got to be specific. It might have been Larry, okay, the French guy. All right, so hat through north and south, same foot, same shoulder, usually on about that fourth step. Eyes up, drive on through that defender. So we'll just do this left and right. This is how, this is how we want to cut block. All right, so here's a picture of the right tackle. We're running a mid zone to the left. He's got, uh, whether it's a four eye or a wide three technique, okay, on about his fourth or his fifth step, he's trying to get that backside shoulder and his hat through north and south, okay, and calf tap that guy. As opposed to if he throws on him too early, the guy block protects, boom, tackle for a one yard game, okay, that's a pretty good job by the right tackle. Okay, another picture of it, I think this is our right guard uh, working the nose guard. We're running a mid zone to the left. Okay, so he's going to pull on about his fourth step through, hat through north and south. The one thing I do see our players do a lot is that hat going right to the ground. We would prefer for them to try to keep their hat up. Shoot, they might be able to climb through him and even get one more. I think he takes about four guys out here as it is. I will say, you know, we, we don't have a four technique over here, but if we did uh, on this particular play, this would be the one time, the one time where our position, position step would be a lead step, other than the goal line. We will lead step on the goal line as well. <clears throat> that position step, usually a pick it up, put it down, or even a drop step. The one time that we'll lead step, <clears throat> and the question came up last night, I think, it, it could be a center on a zero nose, we, we would ask him to lead step to shock that shoulder as he gets through. Be the same thing for the tackle on a four technique if we were running a play like this uh, to the left. Okay, back to the cutting. Okay, I, I love finding examples. So th this is Khalil here uh, from Minnesota on about his fourth step here, hat through north and south. Okay, that, that's what we're looking for, reducing the guy physically. Okay, not going to injure the guy, but it does make him get up off the ground this time and give him another thing to think about. It also, you know, when we start getting people shoved further than they wanted to do and we cut a guy out of a gap, right, that's, that's how these...
plays tend to work. So we're going to do the same thing on a second level player. <clears throat> I've got to know what angle to take. So here we're looking at the right tackle. And he's got to go cut that second level player. So to do that, he's got to take the correct angle. All right? And to do that, we're, we're, we're not going to gallop on this thing. Okay? I'm, going to lead, I'm going to lead step through on the back side. And I'm going to get shot out of a cannon through the ass of the next down lineman or where it's going to be okay, to, get, to try to get my hat through north and south. Okay? So we want to on the back side of these mid zones. Okay? This, this is a pin and pull play. But it's the same thing back here. Get him cut to the ground. And we could see how important that was to the success of that play. All right, wh what do I do when I can't get him cut to the ground? I'm trying to, that's, that's our intent. That's what we're trying to do. But every once in a while, we'll, we'll get out leveraged. So here's a picture of uh, our left guard. Where he's trying to either cut the nose or eventually the second level. And it's the idea of quartering. And uh, Coach McNally was just demonstrating it uh, a couple of instances last night, illustrating quartering a guy. And what that, what that is, is if I were to meet uh, force on force with a defensive player, just straight on, right, he's able to brace. And if I'm able to meet that defender side to side, he's able to brace. But if I will take that defender on a quarter, on a quartering angle, and, and it's much the same principle as getting to a guy's hip, or if I'm running a dual play and I get to that hip, and you, or you know, um, Coach Callahan's uh, guards, boom, they flipper that nose guard and just send him rocking back. It's the same idea. When I hit that guy on a quarter, okay, you, you will move him. And so Jeff, again, as he's going to cut a nose guard, it's disappearing, so now I'm going to climb this backer. I'd like to get him cut, but I'm out leveraged. Instead, just meet him on a quarter, and whether you knock him out of his shoes like he does here, or you just continue to drive him on that angle. We, we like to quarter that defender. Okay, I, I'm constantly in search of quartering uh, pictures. This is a screen here, but it's the same idea again. <clears throat> Here's Larry. He, he wouldn't necessarily cut on this play, though he could, but as he uh, meets a second level defender, it could be a that same uh, left guard working a, a backer and meets him on a quarter, it, that can be devastating to that defender. I love this picture. I think this is Booth from the Giants. Okay, uh, I'll go back to the sideline. This, this is another pin pull play. And he's pulling for a second level defender. And we will, on our pin and pull play, allow our players to cut on the front side of this play, as long as it's on the other side of the line of scrimmage. Typically, it'd be a backside deal. Okay, so we'd allow him to cut him, but if I didn't, wasn't in leverage to cut him, I'd just quarter him. That was a pretty devastating block. You see some of the same things we were talking about when we were drilling our inline inside zone. Same foot, same shoulder. Nice and in line. Okay, the guy's out on his feet. Okay, and then I can't cut him. I can't quarter him. He's really got me out leveraged. Go to a slingshot. Okay, I'm going to use his momentum against him. So I couldn't, I couldn't cut him. I couldn't quarter him. Okay, I use his momentum against him, and I go to the back pad, and I slingshot him through. Okay, uh, here, here's the center. Right? He, he's trying to, we're running a, a toss, I believe, to, to the right. He's trying to, he'd love to get out here and cut that guy, quarter him. So you can see the slingshot. So what we're doing here, we'll, we'll drill these things. We just showed you the drill. Uh, is we want to give these guys finishing moves. Uh, on these blocks. Okay, well, what do you do? How, how do you get that block done? And we want to see him show up on Sunday. Okay, I've never had a guy called for that. Okay, never once had a guy called for that. Okay, he's feeling that momentum. He's losing it. Just go to the back pad and you'll use his momentum against him, gain leverage. Okay, uh, a pretty nice picture here. Same center. This is Brad Meester. He's trying to get leverage on this guy, possibly quarter him, just use his leverage against him. You see 57, okay, and Brad's pretty, pretty crafty player.
So when I first started using that technique, I only let one guy do it because I and um, I hadn't heard anybody talk about it, but I had seen it on tape. I think I'd seen Indianapolis doing it. I'd seen several teams doing it, and I wondered about it. Are the guys just naturally doing it? Are they teaching it? How's that getting done? And I said, uh, Meester, I'm gonna, this is Brad Meester, who played 16 years in the league. Uh, and as he was getting older, he was having a more difficult time reaching these nose guards. And so we might put it, if we were playing a son of a gun over there, we might put it and say, hey, let's toss this thing so that Meester can backpat him. And it became an effective tool for him. And then once he started getting good at this, okay, then everybody wanted to do it. And so we'd say, all right, you can do it, you can do it. So now it's, it's one of our standard tools in our tool belt that we'll let our guys use. All right, so again, he, he's trying to reach this guy. Okay, he can't get him reached. The guy's fighting pressure. Just go with the, back, the, um, the left hand, in this case, to the back pad and pull him through. Okay, and defenders cannot help themselves but to fall down when this happens. Now, the tendency might be to, once you've done that, stand there and admire your work, but then we tell them, now go get you another one. Go get you another one. All right, so uh, Meester here on a nose guard. This happens to be, I think, a toss play. Okay, it, that's a pretty good player. Puts him on the ground. Okay. Uh, e even a little uh, zone uh, front side. Then we said, you know what, I'm not even sure we need to use these. It doesn't even have to be a toss, okay? Can't reach that guy, just using the momentum against him. Okay, uh, Zach Fulton here, our right guard. Right, he's got a, a big job to cut off this nose guard. <clears throat> so he, I'm gonna try to get him cut, but shoot, it's silent count, I'm on the road. This guy's got the jump on me. All right, then just use his momentum against him, pull him through, go get him. Okay, uh, left tackle here again. Tackles is a great tool on some of these three techniques that are in a jet mode. We're running a stretch to the right. Okay, just pulling through. Do you do that in training camp when you're doing like one-on-ones against the defense uh, run blocking? This is a training camp clip, and we don't do the one-on-one -on -one run, but rather than when we're doing a play that would call for a cut, we'll just use this technique. So we get plenty of practice at it. Uh, and then the idea of turn back, somebody spoke on it last night, and uh, it, it just makes too much sense. And that is that I'm going to cut him, I'm going to quarter him, I might have to slingshot him. He ducks in behind me. Okay, if I were to open my left shoulder, I will be opening a path for him to run to the runner. So we're going to teach him to make a tight turn back. And then we can't cut coming back toward the line of scrimmage, so we'll rip above eye level. We'll rip above eye level. So we... That's how we drill turn back. And usually we do this with the calf tap, calf tap, calf tap, turn back, turn back. Okay, so here uh, we've got the left guard and the left tackle. Okay, and we're stretching this thing to the right. These guys, he's playing with slow or lazy feet. He ends up behind me. He was going to cut him. He ducks in behind me. Just a tight turn back. Same thing with the left guard. Okay, shit, I got to wait forever. I'm not sure he couldn't have just blocked him, but he was excited to put the wanted to see the drill on tape. So he showed me a little tight turn back. Okay, that's Austin Pasteur playing for Cleveland now. Okay, uh, even an inline player, I'm going to cut this three technique. I'm on my own on this deal. He ducks in behind me, tight turn back. And again, if he, if he were to open his right shoulder, he will not even make contact on that guy. So we drill it and we, we use it. Center on the nose guard here, stretching it to the left. He ducks in behind me, tight turn back. Coach, how are we for time? 15 minutes. Gotcha. Uh, this is Ryan Lilja, and I just love this, this clip. There's a, that was the first clip I had of this tight turn back business, and we started doing it.
So, uh, Coach Wiley, th th that's what I've got for you on, on some of the zone techniques, but I did want to uh, take just a couple of minutes and touch on empty protection or scat protection, five-man protection. Um, Coach Wiley had told me that there might be some interest in that. So, we run a fair amount of this protection, and I love it. It's one of the easiest protections for us to teach in terms of who to get. Now we got to block those fire breathers, but in terms of who to get, it's one of our easier ones. And uh, I like it because, and believe me, there's a point where you got to max it up, you got to help you guys. Uh, but a lot of times in these uh, one hole coverages or even just uh, blitz man, uh, you, all you're doing is adding rushers when you're adding blockers. So as long as you've got a quarterback, and we've got a terrific quarterback that knows what to do with the ball okay, and how to direct the line, uh, this can be a great protection. So I know in the college game, you're running a ton of it. It's our number one protection. We, we call it more than any other. And for us, uh, we'd say, okay, we got five blockers as we're teaching this thing. So we, if they were to rush five, we'd like to be able to figure out who that fifth rusher is. Okay. So, uh, you know, we see a ton of uh, man coverage. Um, we see over 60% single high. Some other teams may see different percentages than that, but we see a ton of it. All right, and so we try to find, if, if I'm a center, I try to find the guy who doesn't have a, a job to do. In other words, he's not guarding anybody. Okay, that guy is, could be up to no good. Now, I always remind him, look, more than half the time, they're going to rush four. More than half the time. It's not always a freaking blitz. Okay, so we don't sweat this thing too, too much. The quarterback's going to have final say on this thing. But we typically will we'll have a general idea uh, on film study or just, you know, Typically, that guy is going to be away from the back. Okay, so we'll usually sort this thing away from the back, or to the guy that we think he's up to no good. He doesn't have any job to do. And then the other side is going to have a sift. So here in a four-man line, okay, they're going to sort this thing to the left. And then if he's sorting it to the left, he's going to gather anything that's on his nose and sort that to the left. And basically, a gap, b gap, c gap. And then anything that was backside of that, if he's Whatever your RNL word, you know, Ron and Louie, whatever your RNL word is, he, he's going with an L word here. If I'm on the backside of that, I got to sift responsibility. So we're going to take the two most dangerous or the two most insidest rushers, okay? the guys that can affect the A and the B gap. And we, we feel like with this protection, if you can, and really it might be true of any protection, if you can protect those A and B gaps, the quarterback's got a chance. You protect those A and B gaps, he's got a chance. So. He's going with a, a, an L word here, and we've got a sift on the backside, and we're not going to be too, too concerned about it, but we do have to perif him. Now, and it's going to become important when you uh, get into the double A business. Um, so here, here's a case where the center, this is a young center, remember, he's a rookie out of Missouri. He came up and he, he started saying, oh, I want to I rip this thing. And then he thought better of it. He took a peek behind him and he said, you know what? Looks like a guy to guard, a guy to guard. This guy is, doesn't have much to do. And furthermore, uh, I'm not sure I don't have a threat off the slot over there. So he went ahead with an L word. Quarterback's going to have final say. All right. So he went ahead with an L word. These two guys now will take the two most dangerous of those three. That's all we're doing there. Okay. So we call that a sift. Okay, in this case, uh, again, we're, we're, our starting point for a center, he comes up, is usually going to be slide this thing away from the back. Quarterback had a good idea here. You know, the, no, no matter what, this guy in that right gap is up to no good. Now, he, he's the guy, right? The center doesn't know who, who the quarterback's hot answers are. So, again, it's important in this protection that the quarterback's got final say. He might slide us uh, counterintuitively to what we'd want to do, uh, but that's because he knows something we don't. He knows what he wants to do with this ball. He knows, uh, I want to go ahead and be able to just retreat a little bit and, and beat this guy with a hot. But we do have a starting point we can anticipate, right? Half the games, we can't hear what he's saying <clears throat> when we're on the road. So here, we're, you know, we got an R word going here. We're ready to sift this on the left. So I am periphing it. And, and uh, there's a nice job here by the left side uh, squeezing that thing, sifting it on the run. Typically, when he's hitting it from off the ball, okay, we'll just break off our sets like this, so they better be periphonate. 
and, and it's, our technique is going to change a little when he aligns in the A-gap. Okay, so again, we're trying to find the guy who's, who, who's up to no good. The center right here started off with an L word, and the quarterback, you know, feels this rotation by the, by the safety, and, and the guy who's up to no good is this guy who's not stand, standing in his three-week uh, stack, right? If this was three-week, he, he should be stacked over this nose guard. Uh, so he's up to no good. Uh, that ain't right. He's coming down to guard him, so the quarterback redirects it. And when the quarterback redirected it to an R word, so now they're going to R. So again, we're trying to figure out the fifth guy who's coming, right? Or potentially could come. Now this side is a little different than that SIF that they had over there. This guy's in the line of scrimmage. So uh, this, this is a word that I adopted uh, from Paul Boudreau, and we just call that a jelly, right? We're just going to jelly back. And you've got a jelly with a little bit of depth and inside. Okay, we've got to take away worst case scenario. If they're hitting it through the A and B gap, we've got to take that away. But we want to do it with some depth. We can't just squeeze right now. If I was working with a back over here, which I'm not, we're in five-man pro, then I can just squeeze that right now. Let him go to the edge, all right? Uh, depending on your squeeze rules. When I'm when I'm sifting this thing, it's got to be a jelly sift, back and inside a little bit. Then if he bluffs out of there, then we're back out uh, to these two guys. We'll take the two most dangerous. So you got to have to have gotten a little bit of depth to get that done. Okay, one one more picture of it. So we're probably with an R word here, left side. The jelly jelly squeeze on this thing, or jelly sift rather. Nice nice job. Now they're hitting those A and B gaps. Now, one thing that we've learned with these centers, right, I can't just pick a guy, right? I'm going to expose my hip right here. And it is that guard's job to keep him off of his hip. But he, he should drag that a little more so that guard can get a clean send across his face. And then what do you, what do, what do, you do if you get a, an odd defense, okay, two guard bubbles? And we would put bear, right, all three inside. We would put that in the same category for the same reasons. Okay, so... What we'll do is go with an R and an L, right? We'll, we'll sort both sides and we'll lock the center on until we've got a compelling reason not to. That, that'd be our starting point. Okay, just, uh, just go with your R and L. Well, okay, you're, it looks like a five down, uh, but there is a double sort going on until you've got a compelling reason not to. So here's an odd defense. And again, the, whether it's two guard bubbles or just move these guys into three techniques, you've got the same issues. All right, so we're going to, and, and this will be your, your quarterback or your coordinator's uh, preference. Maybe, maybe he doesn't want to do that. Maybe th they're a huge uh, four-week team, four-strong team. Okay, I, I would say take, let's take away saw dog first. Let's take away five-man rush. That would be the most frequent thing we see. And then let's, let's slide the line differently if we have a compelling reason to do that. So we'll double sort this. Two got three, two got three, or whoever. All right, and quarterback's no knows it's going to take two off of each side to make him hot. Okay. So this would be an odd defense with a compelling reason not to sort on the left, right? Uh, I, I love this clip. Okay, the, uh, my because our defensive coordinator does stuff like this. We got to deal with. All right, so we got a whole bunch of dudes over here. All right, so w would make no sense to sort with an L word and an R word. Let's bring our left guard over here. Let's turn this into a four-man slide. Okay, so whatever your word to get that done would be. Okay, there's obviously no threat over here. All right, this left tackle, he's good on this guy. We definitely have a threat over here. All right, so let's slide the line that way. Okay, so this would be uh, an, e an example again, whether it's an odd or a bear. So we're, we have threats on both sides. We'll go ahead and RNL this thing. Okay, we're going to double sort this thing. Ends up oftentimes blocking like a five down. That would be our most frequent rush that we'd see out of people, at least last year. Okay. Now here, <clears throat> when, when you're, th th this kind of came up last year because this started happening more and more. Which side has a sift on this guy? Okay, because they're sorting two most dangerous on this side. They're sorting two most dangerous on that side. And we said, uh, whatever side he rushes on, you guys got the sift. All right. Now, I'd say this guy's up to no good here, right? Somebody's got to guard that back when he flares out here. There's a good probability that it's that defensive end. 
Because if that linebacker is going to guard him, he, he better get his ass over there. So this would be a good time for the quarterback to just turn the line. Just actually full gap it all the way back to this guy. Uh, that's not what happens here. So the side that, had, that he rushed on, they had, the, uh, they had the sift. And again, as long as you're taking care of those A and B gaps, then, then you've got a chance. Quarterback could have turned the line there. Uh, I think he knew the matchup he had there and knew which way to escape to go find that throw. All right, these would be examples of, again, whether it's an under, a bear, a 34, two guard bubbles. Uh, we're going to be R-ing and L-ing, okay? And the quarterback has a compelling reason not to on a uh, uh, game plan. He, he knew one of their favorite dogs, okay, was to bring uh, the, the, this four-week pressure here. So he took the R off, and now we got, we're into a four-man slide. Okay, one, one more example of that. Odd front, we're R-ing and L-ing. We've got a compelling reason, right? There's not much to, to, to sort over here. Let's bring our right guard and let's go with the four man sort over to the left. So for us, uh, I love teaching this protection because, look, if we get, a, we get an odd or a bear, which we get a, a shit ton of, right? It's going to be R and L, or whatever your word is. Uh, they get in an even front. We're going to find the guy that's not doing what, uh, guarding anybody. We're going to slide his way. Other side's got the sift. Just some food for thought there. Men, thank you very much for having me out today. Appreciate it.